right, turn your Bibles this morning to Ecclesiastes 3. And by the way, I've invited Henry and Hazel to sing several songs, two or three songs, how many of they, however many they want to next Sunday. Uh, we're going to have a little mini concert within the service with them. And, and uh, it's kind of partially a celebration of Henry's 90th birthday and, and Hazel uh, being there by his side for so long and him by her side. And you guys are just such an amazing example to all of us with your love for each other. And so we look forward to hearing from you. And may God bless you as you do it. All right, today is part four of our series on being a wisdom seeker in 2017 and with the insights given from the book of Ecclesiastes. And we have seen how the old King Solomon, author of three of the wisdom books of the Old Testament, transparently spoke to a, an assembly of young people about his observations, regrets, and wise conclusions he reached at the, toward the end of his reign as king. He reigned for 40 years. And, and uh, Solomon speaks with a sense of urgency that the youth of his nation not repeat his mistake of straying away from the covenant relationship he had had with the Lord. And, and he referred to much of what he had done as vanity. And by vanity, he revealed that so much of his life experience, even what sometimes the world would think is great uh, achievements, and, and, and uh, had given him no sense of meaning or purpose in life. In fact, he said the end result was the feeling of despair. Now, at the end of your life, you don't want to be living in, in despair, do we? You know, and so Solomon gives us some insights about that, how to avoid that. Uh, and, but at the end of chapter 2, the old king's tone changes from despair to a joyful awareness that everything important and meaningful has passed to him through the hands of God. He, he wrote this, and we're starting in verse 24 of chapter 2, Nothing is better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that his soul should enjoy the good in his labor. This also I saw was the hand of God. For who can eat or who can have enjoyment more than I? So Solomon's great wisdom, knowledge, his wealth, and abilities were gifts from God. And he acknowledged that. He now sees that he has taken too much for granted. His dissatisfaction and his depression have reminded him that he needs the joy of partnership with God in everything. In verse 26, he wrote, For God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who is good in his sight. Now, Solomon had distanced himself, as we've spoken, that from this covenant relationship he had with the Lord, and, and he was sad that it had taken him so long to return to his first love uh, for God. And again, his urgency is felt in his exhortation to his young audience at the end of his message, where in Ecclesiastes 12, he said, remember now your creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come. And that's where Solomon is living. He's living in those difficult days. And the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. But we're in chapter 3 today. And it's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Uh, as Solomon begins his description of life experience under heaven, contrasted with life experience with an eternal point of view. And so, uh, well, let's go there. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Much of under heaven life experience has to do with what is temporary rather than eternal. Everything has its own season. A specific portion of time, a beginning and an ending. We think of seasons uh, usually about what happens through the course of a year. In Tennessee, we have four distinct seasons of weather. Uh, for, we have the, the, summer, the spring and the summer and the fall and the winter. And we're in the winter right now. And I don't need to remind you of that, although some days this winter have seemed like not so much winter. But uh, there have been days when I have longed for the warmth and the beauty of the green bursting forth, you know, in the spring. And I'm looking forward because winter will end. It will come to an end. And uh, there will be a new season. And so seasons are something that has a beginning and an ending to it. We hear about the seasons of life. We hear about seasons of a marriage with each season having distinct characteristics of its own. Now under heaven, the experiences of life have a seasonal purpose rather than permanent. Solomon said there is a time for every purpose under heaven. Time is a stretch or duration in which things happen. It is interesting, though, that the length of time in terms of how it feels depends on the event that we are experiencing. 
For instance, someone said, it is interesting how two weeks spent on a diet drags out oh so slowly, but two weeks on a vacation is over in a flash. You know, so that's kind of the way we experience time. In the under heaven point of view, time is measured by the arrangement of the planetary system uh, and uh, uh, the planets, but eternity and eternal purposes transcend the planetary system. It is not confined to that. Solomon next describes a series of contrasting events, each having its own season, uh, which are common to mankind. And they are like a cross-section of life under heaven. He says there is a time to be born and a time to die. That is the longest season of our lives on earth, under heaven, from birth until death. And in between, there are other seasons that take place, but that's the longest. Birth is obviously an event we have all experienced. I cannot remember my birth but I've been told about it many times by my parents and others. How it happened in the dining room of a church parsonage in Missouri. And how I came into the world so quickly that the doctor barely had time to get there. And how I was the only child which my dad had seen being born. Now, how the medical bill was only $50. It was my time and it couldn't be stopped. Yeah, I was a cheap baby. <laughs> Uh, physical death is the final event that we experience under heaven. And that time will come for all of us unless, unless Christ returns first. And thank God, not all of life happens under heaven. There is an ongoing life for those who have placed their faith in God. A time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, Solomon writes. There's another season. There's a time which is best suited for planting. And it comes and then it goes. If we try planting a garden as we get into winter, uh, then the freezing temperatures will kill off the new plants and, and that would be an inappropriate timing because the season for planting has ended. Uh, there is a time for harvesting produce. If we wait too long, it will rot or the bugs will eat it up. And that time, you see, has its own season of harvesting the produce and it, it has an ending as well. A time to kill and a time to heal. Now, we can only guess what Solomon would have been thinking of when he said there is a time to kill. Uh, it could be that he was thinking of self-defense being a time with, uh, that you could kill or, or capital punishment. He could have been thinking of animal sacrifices uh, and, or, or killing of animals for food purposes. Sometimes when animals are suffering and cannot be healed and uh, they are relieved of their suffering by killing them, by putting them down. Uh, since this line is contrasted with there is a time, time to heal, it is possible that application could actually be made that it means to desist from the medical treatment that is long, no longer effective in prolonging life. Uh, such as we think of that when it comes to hospice, where they make a person the person who has no more medical treatment that can help them at all, and so they are near death, and so they are made comfortable and, and given medication to relieve their pain and in a very lovely environment. Uh, and the family can be there as much as they want and, and, and be with them and bring comfort to them. Clearly, he is talking about being a season, there being a season of healing to apply resources until a person recovers from illness or injury. There is a season for healing and recovery. And anybody that's had surgery understands that. You know, I had shoulder surgery this past year and this past week. I went to my last appointment with my surgeon and he declared that I was healed. You know, that my time, my season of recovery was over. Uh, and I uh, still have a little thing about reaching too far behind my back, you know, and I'm getting there. I can actually reach, you know, the third belt loop across there. And I couldn't do that a few months ago at all. So that there's a season for recovery. A time to break down and a time to heal, build up. When a house is falling apart and the foundation is crumbling, it is time for demolition. That house has gone through its season of viability. Uh, and its season is over. On the other hand, it can be re if it can be repaired and rehabbed, there is a time for that. And there is a lot of that going on in East Nashville right now. If you drive through that community and you used to go through there and you're thinking, well, God, keep me safe, you know, kind of thing, uh, because there's gangs everywhere, you know, it's not that way anymore. You drive through there, there's all kinds of rehab that's gone on, even new homes being built, and, you know, the, everybody wants to live in East Nashville. I'd never dreamed that would be the case. 
you know. And so uh, there's a time for that. Uh, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. There's, there is an appropriate time for weeping and mourning. When we are going through a grief over the loss of a loved one or a friend, it's appropriate to weep at that time. And even other, through the grief journey, we find ourselves weeping. I'm always amazed to hear said about someone who's weeping over this kind of loss that they're just really not handling it very well. But you know I, what I believe? I, probably, I think they're probably handling it better than people who don't weep. You know, there's a way that we need to weep because comfort comes through weeping and mourning over our losses. That's what God has prescribed for us. And so that's wrong. It is highly appropriate to express the emotional pain of a great loss. To weep during grief is highly appropriate. There's a time to laugh and a time to dance at a wedding or at a graduation party. Uh, it's a great time to, to laugh and dance and have a great party with one another. And uh, there is a time, uh, well, Scripture says that laughter is like a medicine. We looked at that last week. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. You know, Israel is a very stony place. If you've ever been to Israel, you know that there it just stones everywhere. It's appropriate to cast away stones when clearing a place for a garden or a farmer's field. It's appropriate to gather stones when building a stone fence or wall or a stone house. And in fact, uh, you know, uh, most of the houses, especially back during this time in Israel, were made of stone. Uh, so uh, it's uh, uh, because there's so much of it, they utilized it. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. It's appropriate to embrace a loved one with affection, but not to embrace a stranger. It is not appropriate to embrace a person who is angry. When the conflict is over, then the time to embrace comes again. It is not appropriate to embrace an offender, but when repentance is walked out, we embrace with forgiveness, like with the father and his prodigal son. Remember the great embrace and kiss that he gave his son. In verse 6, a time to gain and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away. Life tends to go through cycles of gains and losses. Isn't that right, Paul? <laughs> you know, everybody that's got a retirement account understands that. You know, there are gains and losses, and Paul says that don't worry during the time of loss because the gains are coming, you know. So it's just, if you live long enough, you'll see that cycle constantly repeating itself. There's a, a, a time, an appropriate time, to hang on to something and to throw things away. I struggle with that one. Sometimes I hang on to things I do not need. When Vicky does a yard sale, I sort through the things and say to myself, I can't get rid of that. <laughs> even though I hadn't done anything with it or even remembered I had it, you know, for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, or I might still need this someday. But, you know, knowing that giving it to a thrift store, and that's what we do with most of the things that we don't need, we give it to thrift stores like the Goodlettsville Help Center or the Samaritan Center in Hendersonville, and uh, there you know that when they resell what has been given, it will go to help needy families. And that's a beautiful way to throw things away or give things away. You know, so someone else can benefit from it. Of course, some things are just broken and should be thrown away. And, uh, you know, they even have signs at the thrift stores about that. Please do not turn in broken things <laughs> or things that do not work. A time to tear and a time to sew. Sometimes it is appropriate to tear a garment in order to make rags, or it may be appropriate to sew up a tear in order to continue a garment's use. Just for some reason was reminded of my first job at the age of five years of, age, of old. Uh, I, was, I picked cotton for the you know, made my first $3 picking cotton. And my mother took an old dress and sewed it up for a cotton, a cotton sack for me. And I remember that and will never forget it. And I made my first three, three bucks in life uh, picking cotton. Well, that's something some of you didn't know about me. <laughs> There's a time to love and a time to hate. We are to love people but hate evil. We can love people and hate what people do. Jesus said that we are to love even our enemies, but that does not mean that we are to condone their behavior. When Abraham Lincoln was a young man and for the first time saw a slave auction in the city of New Orleans, where a fellow human being was being sold to the highest bidder, Lincoln said, 
There was a rising hatred inside of me against slavery, and I swore that if someday I could do something about it, I, I would do something about it. We all know, of course, that he kept that promise and did something about it. A time of war and a time of peace. There's an appropriate time for war as long as there are evil people in the world who are destroying the peace and well-being of others, there will be times to take a stand against them. World War II is clearly an example of that. As a man named Hitler was leading uh, the, the uh, war against so many others, destroying lives, counting a lot of human beings as of no value at all, and committing genocide, he had to be stopped. And clearly there was no peaceful solution in dealing with Hitler. Yet it would be inappropriate to go to war if a peaceful solution can be found. Now, what does Solomon's review of these contrasting events tell us about being wisdom seekers? In many of these contrasting pairs, there may be a conscious decision required one way or the other. Wisdom and emotions can sometimes become competitors with each other as we make that decision. Many years ago, I stood in a hospital with parents whose 26-year-old son was dying of cancer. His bowel had become perforated. The doctor said he could do surgery and their son would almost certainly die on the operating table. If he survived, it was still a matter of about a week of extending his life. Or they could allow him to have 12 hours to visit with them and his friends. After we prayed for wisdom, they had peace about taking those few hours to visit with him and allow his friends to come around him and visit with him as well. This young man was on our youth staff here, and he played in a popular local band. Young people filled his room, and there was lots of singing and exchange of loving conversation and prayers together. In fact, Vanderbilt Medical Center gave an extra room next to him for us all to gather in so that we could take turns going in and out of his room by his bedside and conversing. He couldn't talk, uh, but he could write, and he gave thumbs up to a lot of things. I'll never forget it for, in all my life. Uh, you know, uh, that, but those parents... As they watched those young people come around him, they watched the fellowship that was being had and the worship going on around his bed, they knew they had made the right decision. You know, but they needed God's wisdom. And they, in fact, they kind of asked me to make the decision for them, and I said, I cannot do that. The doctors wouldn't even have allowed that. You know, it was their decision to make. As wisdom seekers, there is wisdom God gives when we ask for it. In his epistle, James wrote, James 1, 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Now, I believe that when God gives us his wise counsel, his divine counsel, it will be accompanied by his peace within our hearts. Paul wrote in Colossians 3, 15, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. The point is that, that the peace of God kind of acts like a referee in our hearts. When we are making a choice that is in the will of God, there will be a quietude within our hearts, a sense of spiritual and emotional rest, like a green light to move ahead with something. He says in verse 9, What profit has the worker from that in which he labors? He asks a question that we need to all ask from time to time. Is what I am doing in life... What purpose does it have? What value might it have? Uh, of what value is doing whatever it is that I'm doing? Is, is, is the way I'm spending my time profitable to others and to me? I found a website showing 22 photos of stairs that go nowhere. Do you ever feel like you're expending a lot of time and energy going nowhere? It appears that Solomon felt that way about a lot of what he had been doing. Solomon then repeats the primary theme of the book of Ecclesiastes. He tells us that nothing we do has any lasting value unless the handprint of God is upon it, unless we are partnering with God. Think about the mistakes you've made, the miscalculations in judgment. Would you have made those same mistakes if you had thoroughly placed your faith and trust in God and and had uh, consulted with him and asked him for wisdom, there's a good chance you wouldn't have. 
Verse 10, I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. So Solomon is saying something very special here. He is saying that God is at work in the world, giving directions, which may not at the time seem to have a whole lot of purpose or value, but after a while, the beauty of God's intervention becomes clear. Why did I choose the word intervention here? It's because God wants to be invited into everything we're doing, into all the situations we're going through in life. The events we experience in this fallen world are sometimes difficult, but he can take a tragedy, a heartbreaking relationship failure, the loss of a job, and work his hands into it until the ugliness is transformed into reshaping of our lives in such a way that beauty comes into it. My mother was telling me how a friend of my brother had received an email from a soldier in Iraq a few number of years ago, and he told of how they had been engulfed in a horrible blinding sandstorm, which paralyzed their unit, and they thought, well, what an awful experience this has been. That's what they thought at first. Uh, but that was when they all noticed that the high winds had blown the sand away, sand away enough to reveal where the landmines were. So that sandstorm saved a lot of lives, as awful as it was when they went through it. It, it revealed the, the landmines. There had been a great loss of life otherwise. So I hope you see this. The under heaven point of view is something like a, can be something like a terrible sandstorm, but the eternity point of view is a revelation of the landmines. Regardless of whatever events we go through, when we partner with God, he eventually will work his beauty into that event and that, his purpose into those things we go through. Notice here what it says about God. God gives a task for people to do. God makes things beautiful over time. Take whatever employment a person has, for instance. An under heaven point of view is that, you know, I've got a job and a paycheck and that's how I pay the bills. And, you know, on Friday you say, thank God it's Friday, you know. But what if your view of your employment changed to something a little different? You know, what if uh, you saw your employment as something that had been given to you by God? An opportunity that the Lord had afforded to you. The eternal point of view is that God gives us these jobs as a place to love people, to pray for them, and to minister to him, them. There's a man I know. He worshiped with us for many years. Now he's moved away. But he worked as a department supervisor in a large industry. He had a Bible study for anyone who wanted to come. And he also prayed with them about what was going on in their lives. And you should hear him. You should have heard him talk about the men and women who worked under him and how much he loved them and cared about them. You see, that's the task that God has given us to do. It's not just a paycheck. It's not just a job. But it's an opportunity to be the voice of God, to be the hands of God reaching out, to be the love of God being expressed to someone who needs his love. God himself is at work from beginning to end. Even though we cannot often see it until the work is finished or until the end of our lives, we may never see it. I think Solomon's saying here, you know, all the ways that God has worked through you and around you, you'll never know it all. But count it down. Put it in your ledger of life, your life ledger. There are many things that have happened, you know, in your life, whatever you're doing, that have affected people in a powerful way. And you may not even hear about it, you know. I had a woman one day at her restaurant flag me down. And she told me, she said, you know, I was about to drop out of church till you said a kind word to me at church that one day. And that was a number of years earlier. I didn't know that. I didn't know she was thinking about qu quitting going to church. She was so discouraged. She said, I told the Lord. <laughs> she said, I told the Lord, if you'll send somebody to say a kind word to me today, I'll keep coming to, to worship in church. And so I, I gave her that kind word. And I don't know 
you know, I've probably messed up a few people along the way too. <laughs> but hopefully there's a few people around, you know, who've had a positive impact in their life uh, because who knows what. So we know that God works with things for good. Romans 8, 28, beautiful promise. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Uh, and the question arises, how can my loss, my pain, and my failure be something that can turn out beautiful? What we must do here is understand that between our birth and our death, God knits the many parts of our lives together and experience into a whole unit of beauty. He takes the difficult things and weaves it right in there with the beautiful, with things that are wonderful. And, and through it all, through it all, you know, we, we have a great, great, great whew, have to get some uh, uh, new lips or something, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, get that... Uh, that software refreshed, you know. <laughs> but I, was, I was looking at Elisa Dooley here, and she's written a book about that. Uh, what great gain she's experienced in her life through her suffering. I ran across that book in my library the other day. You know, it's beautiful. Ask her where, she can get, where you can get a copy of that. As a pastor, I've had many wonderful experiences, more than I could ever number. But I've also been victimized, been taken advantage of, lied about, and made some foolish mistakes. Yet I can see how God has been working it all together into a recipe which is accomplishing his eternal purposes in me and making me into a better person. Look back at verse 1 again. There is a time for each event under heaven, and then there is a time for purpose to be added to the event. Now we can see it more clearly. We live in a world where wonderful things happen and where painful things happen and difficult things happen. God loves us so much that he wants to somehow lay his hand upon the painful experiences of life and help us gain something good from them. God speaks to us through our pain. C.S. Lewis acknowledged that. He said, pain is God's megaphone. He whispers to us in our pleasures, but shouts to us in our pain. God does not produce tragedy or human failure. Get that out of your thought patterns. God is not responsible for tragedy. He's not responsible for the pain we go through. That comes from living in a fallen world under Satan's influence. And uh, one day Jesus will return and he'll set up his kingdom upon this earth and uh, things will be different. God produces only good gifts and only light. In him there is no darkness at all. Did you hear that? Do you know that? Don't ascribe darkness to God, ever. I hear people do it all the time. Christians. There is no darkness in him, not at all. Only light and only good gifts. So what we come to is this, that between a person's Birth and death, all kinds of things happen. Some are happy, some are sad. Yet God in his goodness over time will use them all, both the good and the bad, to accomplish his purposes in our lives. And in time he makes all things, even those things that were inappropriate, into something which brings, brings about good. Also he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. Here we see a powerful insight about how God makes us on the inside. He has put eternity in our hearts. This means that God did not make us just for this world, but for the life after this life we have now. That's, one, that's a season. And when that season ends, there's more. Whatever we experience in this world is never enough. We always have this sense that there's more here yet to come. And this might explain the fascination people have with fantasy books and movies, you know, with Star Wars and Lord of the Rings, even the Chronicles of Narnia and many other things. You know, that knowing that there must be more than what we see around us. Eternity in our hearts means we have a blessed hope that out of our covenant 
relationship with the Lord, we will live on in his presence. And once we experience the second bookend of life under heaven, death becomes an open door uh, into greater life than ever. But I think there's a more immediate application to what this means. Eternal life is not just life after death. It means the quality of life which God intended for mankind when Adam and Eve were created. It is living life God's way. And I think eternity in one's heart is a yearning for life the way God intends it to be. It's, it's, it's a, a yearning to grow. A yearning to be far more. It's this thing of we've been redeemed and God wants to lift us out of things that we've been entrenched in for years and bring positive, redemptive change into us. It's this, to dream of accomplishing something meaningful and profitable in this world, to see people the way God sees them, to understand God's ways, to be able at the end of the day to say, just as God said when he did the creation, it's good. It's been a good day. Over the years, I've seen many new believers come into the kingdom of God and I've watched some grow from being unstable, fearful persons without any vision for life into people of spiritual and mental health who are confident and growing, achieving good things and having hope in their hearts. That's the eternity that's in our hearts right there. So, other than knowing God has called me to be a pastor, that's what keeps me going, that there's more. You know, other than being a, a husband and a father and a grandfather and having a, being a friend to so many lovely people in my life, that's what keeps me going, that God has more for me. How about you? Are you tapping into the eternity that God has placed in your heart? Or are you reacting with pessimism to the fallen world around you? Well, things happen in this world, which seem so untimely, and perhaps they are. But God works with all things for the good of those who love him. For every crisis, guess what? It has a season. It has a beginning and an ending. And sometimes we think it's never going to end. But it will. Just as winter will come to an end and spring will come forth, that crisis, your end, will end. And we place our trust that God's going to see us through it. It's a season. While we go through these crises, God is at work to give it value. Over time, he makes things inappropriate and ugly into something which has value and purpose in our lives. Bad things happen even to good people. But God in his mercy uses the broken pieces to form something of beauty. What is going on in your life right now? Regardless of what's going on, be a wisdom seeker. Wisdom from God is the investment that he makes in us to make life more profitable especially when things are difficult. Again, guys, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and keep being a wisdom seeker in all things. Amen.